Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the second day of British Council's 2016 Teacher Development Sigma J event. Oh, okay. It's the second day because the first day was just one session. Anyway, welcome back. Welcome back. I hope that you had a very nice and well deserved rest after a very content rich and informative day yesterday. That was good yesterday. Um, and, and I hope that you are fresh and ready to learn some more from the uh, Also, I would like to welcome everyone who's joining us online through live streaming. And I hope they enjoyed the yesterday's session as well. Uh, as you know, we are going to have two sessions today. And in the first session, Scott is going to uh, focus on the concept of fluency. He's going to address the difference between productive fluency and perceptive fluency. And uh, what this how these can affect teaching in the classroom. Again, before we start the session, I'm going to kindly ask you to turn off your mobile phones or put them on silence. And please join me to welcome Scott for the session. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ada. And thanks once again, and I'm so impressed. I don't know any other place I've ever been where I've seen so many people on a Sunday morning coming to a talk, so this is really impressive, really impressive. Um, yes, so we're going to look at um, fluency, and again, as I said yesterday and the evening on Friday, these are not necessarily um, interdependent sessions, they are five different sessions, but you'll see there's lots of links across the themes that I find challenging and interesting. Uh, and again, we'll try and allow, allow a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers. But first of all, I want you to do a task for me. Uh, I'm going to play you two speakers uh, of English, learners of English. Your job is simply to rate their fluency yeah? on a scale of 1 to 10. 10, extremely fluent. One, not fluent at all. That's all you do. It's not a test. Again, I'm just kind of curious uh, to see what you come up with. You'll hear two speakers, or well, you'll see them, uh, and you'll, first of all, you'll hear them without this text. Yeah, and then I'll let you just process what you've heard, decide on a number. I'll let you compare, and then you'll hear them again, and this time you'll be able to see the actual transcript of what they're saying, just so you can, if you want to change the, your opinion. Are you ready for that? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if this works. Uh... Just to Uh, 
Okay, that's number one. So make a, make a note uh, of what you think, and then I'll play. We'll go straight into number two. Okay. Hi guys, my name is Vera. I'm happy to see you on my channel. And today I'm going to tell you a few words about Russians who try to speak English. Yes, that's me. I'm a Russian girl. I live in Moscow. I was born in Moscow. And um, yeah, a few words about Russians uh, and English, English language. Just general information. Normally we start uh, our English classes um, in uh, in school, at school, at school, okay, uh, about first, second, third grade, like that. And we start from just very beginning, um, you know, common Russian school, we, 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 we don't have uh, really uh, good teachers, really, uh, you know, we're not so involved in English. At school, okay, we have uh, special schools, special English, English Russian schools, but not much. And uh, most uh, of people they just don't speak really well and don't like speak English just because it's difficult. Yeah, <laughs> it's difficult for, for Russians, but not <laughs> not as difficult as for these people, I'm sure. But uh, if we compare some some uh, European countries, um, we can take Spain and France. Uh, I'm sure you know that Spanish people and French people they just don't like and don't really uh, good in English in general. I mean just in general. Um, and uh, if you look at Russia, this is just. You know, quite the same because Russians they like uh, Russian language and in general uh, they uh, they not feel uh, the power of English language. Um, if if you want to work internationally, if you want to uh, get a really good job in Russia, of course you should speak English. It's just enough. It's obvious. Um, Whoop, um, sorry, we'll stop that. Okay, so before we listen, uh, <laughs> shut up. Just um, right, yeah. Compare now what you gave them out of ten, each of them, yeah, and decide between you which you think is better, or more fluent, or less fluent, the boy or the girl, yeah. Before we go on to. Okay, let's just listen again and we'll, and we'll follow the text just in case there's anything you want to. So this is not him. Whoop. Whoop. Not this one. Okay. Hang on. Let's try again. I Native speakers, no, and I uh, just uh, wanted to know 
how many mistakes I make, how is how it is my pronunciation, and uh, yes, I'm just gonna make uh, I'm just gonna start to make uh, videos also because I want to, I would really would like to find people uh, who want uh, to speak uh, in English and me or also in French, Spanish. Uh, and uh, Italian as well because I'm a native speaker of Italian and uh, if you need some help with Italian uh, for me it uh, could be only a pleasure to help you uh, yes, uh, I'm, today in this video I'm just gonna tell you something about uh, how I discovered uh, the, the right way to learn languages uh, one, year, one year ago because uh, at the beginning I just uh, studied uh, grammar and uh, this bad stuff <laughs> because at the beginning studying grammar it is not so good because uh, you are going to be bored, bored from the process and uh, in learning languages uh, this uh, could uh, never happen by using the right way to study you know, the language and uh, yes uh, I just want to tell you also that I don't love all, all, I don't love uh, only to learn languages, but I love uh, also reading. Uh, okay. And now, Vera. Hi guys, my name is Vera. I'm happy to see you on my channel, and today I'm gonna tell you a few words about Russians. Who try to speak English? Yes, that's me. I'm a Russian girl. I live in Moscow. I was born in Moscow. And um, yeah, a few words about Russians uh, and English, English language. Just general information. Normally, we start uh, our English classes um, in. Uh, in school, at school, at school, okay. Uh, about uh, first, second, third grade, like that. And we start from just very beginning. Um, you know, common Russian school, we, 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 we don't have uh, really uh, good teachers, really, um, you know, we're not so involved in English at school. Okay, we have uh, special schools, special English, English Russian schools, but not much. And uh, most uh, of people they just don't speak really well and don't like speaking English just because it's oh. difficult. <laughs> it's difficult for, for Russians, but not not as difficult as for Chinese people. I'm sure, but uh, if we co <laughs> compare some some uh, European countries. We can take Spain and France. Uh, I'm sure you know that Spanish people and French people, they just don't like and don't really uh, good in English, in general. I mean just in general. Um, and uh, if you look at Russia, this is just, you know, quite the same. Because Russia, they like uh, Russian language and in general, uh, they are, they not feel uh, the power of English language. Um, if if you want to work internationally, if you want mm. to uh, get a really good job in Russia, of course you should speak English. It's just you know, it's obvious. I just realized I've mistranscribed. This was international. And this one, and don't like speak English. Yeah. yeah no. Okay. So have another quick chat. One half a half a minute. Do you have you changed your mind? Do you do you agree? And then I'll we'll have a show of hands to see how you rate them. Ah, uh, no. I'll show you in a minute. Yeah, I forgot to put it, but I. Good question. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, let's see.
So let's have a show of hands. Okay, so for the boy. Anybody give him 10? Okay, just, just asking. Nine? Some nines. Eight. Eight. One or two. Eight. Seven. Seven. Yeah, okay, six. Five. Five. Interest. Ooh. Four. Three. A few threes. Two. One. Zero. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. Let's do the girl and then I'll, well, I'll get some feedback from you as to why. Yeah, okay, so uh, Vera, 10, 9, 8, okay, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, <laughs> You are tough. I wouldn't want you for my teacher. <laughs> One, zero. Okay. Now, just to, to compare them, it's not fair to compare them. For a, for a start, they don't, their first languages are not the same. So, but that's the best I could do. I couldn't find a Russian boy on YouTube, in, <laughs> interestingly enough, speaking English. So I had to use the Italian. But, uh, but just out of curiosity, who rates... The boy more fluent than the girl. The Italian boy more fluent than the Russian girl. Okay, who rates the Russian girl more fluent than... Ooh, that's interesting. Now, I want... That's very interesting. And who rates them the same? Yeah, okay. I don't think... You know, that's, that's interesting. I ought to say that these people don't know that you are rating their English. <laughs> I'm not sure that they would approve, but this is one of the hazards, isn't it, of putting up videos on YouTube that somewhere some linguist is going to grab them and take them to a conference in Armenia and have everybody <laughs> rate their English. <laughs> but that's, you know, this fantastic material. And I'll come back to it uh, in a minute. But let's just, I, I'm just curious as to know what your criteria are. So those of you who rated... Um, the boy quite high. Why? Shout it out. Any ideas? Fewer hesitations. Fewer hesitations. Fewer, okay, that's interesting. Yes, so he didn't pause, wait, yeah. He did, yeah. More natural, but what do you mean by natural? Ah, okay, so he was willing to talk. That's interesting. Did he come across as more communicative? You think? A little more accurate. Ah, a little more, more accurate. Yes. Do you mean grammatically or lexically? Okay. And you think that's part of? No, but we're not judging on accuracy. Okay. Well, we'll, <laughs> but, well, we'll come back to that point. But this is one of the problems of actually defining what fluency is and its relation to accuracy. Yeah. He didn't correct himself. He did at one point when he did that spoke, speak, and spoke kind of thing. Yeah. And she did too, interestingly enough, with her prepositions. But there wasn't a lot of self-repair, that's true. Um, would that have made him more fluent or less fluent if he'd been repairing his, correcting himself as he spoke? Possibly less fluent, yeah. He might have got less information across in the... Anything else? Any other reasons why you thought uh, he, the boy, was fluent? Yeah. I don't know if it is a criteria, but for me, the boy was sounding more intelligible. For example, I can say very precisely what he wanted to convey. Uh -huh. because, uh, he was learning to speak English, and uh, he wanted to share his English speech to the community. Okay. He offered his help in Italian. Uh -huh. So you think overall his message was more coherent? That's interesting. That's interesting. It did, uh, it did appear at times that she was kind of losing the path a little bit. What? Well, yes, now that's a very good point. I wanted to choose accents that you would be more familiar with deliberately because I didn't want to be comparing two different accents. Uh, but I felt that the boy, everybody's familiar with Italian accent. Yeah. 
Uh, so that was a safe bet. But if I'd played you a Spanish speaker, you would have had more trouble, I think. So it's a, it has a lot to do with what you're used to in terms of the accent, but also the point that you made is very interesting about the overall message, the coherence. You call it intelligibility. Well, intelligibility could be a feature of accent, but of course so it is what I would call the coherence, the, the message itself in its entirety. See, what's very interesting about both of these, and I'm assuming, is that they were not rehearsed, they were not prepared, they were kind of unscripted, they were spontaneous, which is really interesting because people do this and you can almost hear them thinking while they're speaking. And that's also a sign of fluency, isn't it? The ability to think and speak at the same time. And you think maybe the boy did it better. Any other comments? Any, anything in favor of Vera? Oh, no, not in favor. <laughs> OK, another comment. Did you hear that? That Vera was a little slower than Luigi, whatever his name is, yeah. And in fact, that's confirmed by, this is the, uh, it's at 2.12, yeah, I, I'll just go ahead. Uh, that was the speech rate. So he was 2.212 per second. She was a bit slower, but still not bad, actually. Uh, she speaks a lot, but says nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you should hear what, the, how it continues. She, uh, she really gets confused. But <laughs> yeah. Something in favor of the girl. Uh, her pauses were more content-based, so she was conceptualizing what to say. Uh, rather, the boy was uh, trying to formulate the language uh, and uh, outsourcing to his lexis and grammar. And uh -huh. Very uncertain uh, what kind of language he was yeah. using. Why the girls? Causes were all trying to find the content and conceptualize. Okay, so you again, this relates to the speaking and th and thinking at the same time. You felt that she, but you said something about her pauses, suggesting that she paused. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, to be fair to Vera, she also, she didn't, there weren't any long pauses, very many, and there, wa there weren't many ums and ahs. There wasn't a lot of hesitancy, uh, although she spoke a little bit slower. But she, uh, she this, you know, if fluency, if one measure of fluency is the amount of non-speaking time, the dead time, then neither of them had a lot of disfluency in that respect, to their credit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. Very often I felt that those filled poses mm -hmm. so were meaningless. Mm -hmm. Totally. Mm -hmm. it, it just wanted to say something. And, uh -huh. uh, it was obvious. There uh -huh. Lots of students like that. They think that if they say something and then fill in <laughs> the poses, they are so super, super cool. Did you get that? So, that, yeah, the Vera was criticized in a sense for she's just f speaking for the sake of speaking, no. but it doesn't really have it much content. So it comes back to this. This, this thing about the overall coherence of the message. Uh, but also, we can't and eradicate... Yes? Considered uh, Russian high, high in other languages. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's sort of the, the content, in fact, that's interesting, influence your perception of her. And what we can't ever separate, I think, and one reason I wanted to show you videos rather than just play recordings, is that you cannot separate the personality of the two speakers, and, and we are going to be, uh, not only the personality, the gender, that these factors have been shown to influence our perceptions of a person's fluency, almost subliminally, that we may be more predisposed to somebody who we would like, we would, grant, we would, we would rate them higher in terms of their fluency. So it's a very complicated, it's a very, very complicated and difficult thing. So I, I have no answers. I'm not going to tell you what I think because, I mean, I don't know what I think. I'm just interested in what you think. And I'm particularly interested in what you think of the Russian speaker because that's not an accent that I'm so familiar with. Yes, um, Marina. Thanks. 
Uh huh. Well, that's a very interesting point. That perhaps confirms the point over there that the influence of the first language, the so called super segmental features of phonology, that is the rhythm and the intonation. You could hear the it Italian intonation coming through very strongly with his, although I don't think it was intrusive to the point that it made him unintelligible. And similarly, there was clear traces of Vera's first language rhythm and intonation. But perhaps she did it more successfully, so she didn't qu sound quite so influenced by her first language. I mean, I was quite impressed, being not so familiar with the Russian accent, that I found her, I didn't have to strain to understand what she was saying. It was more at the level of the content itself. I found it slightly incoherent at, at points. But I mean, you know, for heaven's sake, she's doing it unrehearsed and spontaneous. And also, bear in mind, it's non-interactive. It's a monologue, so they don't have the help. They don't have the fact... A dialogue, at least, you have moments where you can kind of plan while the other person's talking. Although dialogue, of course, is even more difficult in some ways because you don't know what's going to be thrown at you. But this is a difficult exercise in any language. So all credit to them. Okay, well, that's fantastic. Um, Besides, uh, if, um, from point of view of average uh, Russians who speak English, I think that she has mastered really good language because I've mm -hmm. lived in Russia. Mm -hmm. I know that it's such a big deal, really, mm -hmm. for them to speak English. So it's, it's, uh, she's, she's really fluent from mm -hmm. that point. Okay. We can, turn the, um, we can turn the sound off this now if we need, because I don't need it anymore. Okay. Whoops. Okay, that was fantastic. Yes, a couple more comments and then we'll move on. Yes. Um, with my speaking uh, pair, we thought that they were equal because um, they were um, both expressing themselves on an intermediate level. Mm -hmm. Intermediate. The information that they were conveying uh, was the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were not discussing very difficult topics. The amount of vocabulary they were using were, were almost the same as mistakes, like the boy was making mistakes and the girl was changing her words. So we thought they were um, almost the same. I know, that I think so. You're absolutely right. Did you get that? They're very well matched. What level would you give them on the European, the common European framework? B1? B1. You think the boy was better? Well, your point was that they're more or less matched. I certainly in terms of... And certainly in terms of the grammatical sophistication, it would be interesting to do a... It would be interesting to study this in more detail in terms of the uh, complexity. The clause length, for example, the number of noun phrases, etc., all that kind of stuff would be interesting. I mean, I haven't done that analysis, but that's certainly relevant. But I think your point is that I think they act quite well matched. Yeah, B1, B2. Any... Yes? Well, well let's, let's use the mics as... Uh, I would like to add just that uh, the, boy, the boy was eager to speak and he didn't pay much attention to his uh, mistakes mm -hmm. and that's why and also he was and expressing his, his thoughts at the same time mm -hmm. it helped him to mm -hmm. express his thoughts more fluently though with, uh, grammar, with grammar mistakes and so on but uh, he was much more communicative and mm -hmm. about the girl first she was very fluent because mm -hmm. her pronunciation is more, was much more better and mm -hmm. I didn't notice that she was Russian at first. Oh really? Mm. But the boy it was very obvious that he was Italian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then the girl began uh, became confused and she couldn't find mm -hmm. words and uh, express her thoughts. Mm -hmm. She couldn't sing and express her thoughts at the same time. Mm -hmm. The boy could overcome, overcome mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these Mm -hmm. That's an e excellent summary. I think you've put, pulled together a number of words. I like the fact that you use the term communicative, and I want to come back to that. Let's move on. By the way, uh, do you think this is an interesting, interesting exercise to do? Could you do it with your colleagues in your institution? I think it's a very useful thing to do because it's our, we don't often do this, but compare our impressions professionally with our colleagues as to what constitutes things like fluency or written 
also with, in written composition as well, but with spoken fluency. Now, this stuff is available. It's up. This, all you have to do is go into YouTube and search for Russian speaking English. Actually, I looked for Armenian speaking English, but I couldn't find anybody who was, wasn't so brilliantly good already that they, they wouldn't have been worth talking about. So, but it's a really, really interesting resource now, and it's something I think will be exploited in, in the professional development sessions because it brings out all these issues that sometimes we don't actually confront about questions of accent, questions of coherence, questions of content um, in terms of how we judge. And yet we're constantly, as teachers, having to make these decisions, aren't we, about judging the fluency of our speakers at the end of the year and exams, etc. Interestingly, in Spain, they've just introduced, they have this exam at the end of the secondary school cycle before you go into university, and it's a very important exam and they test the uh, foreign languages, uh, which is typically English, and they used to do that with a written multiple choice grammar kind of test. They've introduced now a speaking component into that exam, a speaking and a listening component, which is 40% of the whole assessment, which is major. And you, can you imagine what effect that's going to have on teaching when people realize they're going to be tested on their speaking, not just on their grammar and their vocabulary, etc. So this is, this is the way things are moving. But we need to know how to rate fluency. We need to know what the criteria are. We need to know what fluency is. So let's have a look. Um, these are some of this is the kind of dictionary definitions of fluent. And this is what I think we need to uh, move, away, move on from, because this is insufficient. The idea that simply fluid or flowing doesn't really tell us enough about what spoken fluency is. Um, and the synonyms, eloquent, articulate, etc., are equally uh, unscientific. We need something a little bit more precise. So the last X number of years in uh, psycholinguistics, linguistics, has been looking at this concept of fluency and trying to come up with some definitions. Here is one definition. Now, remember in the 1970s, 1980s, fluency suddenly rose to prominence because there was this major shift in methodology from the accuracy-focused methodologies like audiolingualism, etc., to the more fluency-focused methodologies like the communicative approach. And the whole point of the communicative approach was to elevate fluency to the status of being a goal in itself uh, and independent of accuracy. So fluency needed to be defined independently of accuracy. And so one definition was that it's a natural language. Natural, we came up with that, didn't we? It was one of the first adjectives you used was natural, about the boy. Whether or not it results in native speaker-like language comprehension or production. In other words, there's a clear separation here from the idea of accuracy, that it's all about natural language use. Not necessarily fast language use, but just it has to somehow have this kind of natural, real light. But it doesn't have to be native speaker-like at the same time. But this is still very, very vague. It's very, very difficult to test, because what is natural? How do you define it? So uh, people have been interested more interested in the sort of statistical side of things, like Peter Skeen wants to measure fluency. We need something that is measurable. And so fluency was kind of redefined by the, these researchers as something that the production of language in real time without undue pausing or hesitation, without undue pausing or hesitation. And that you can measure. You can measure how many words per second. You can measure how many pauses per utterance, etc. And so this is a, at least, it's, uh, it's an accessible definition of fluency, even if it doesn't necessarily cover uh, the kinds of areas that Brumford refers to. Then somebody else called Thornbury uh, said the capacity to be communicative in real-time conditions. So this is bringing in this notion of communicativeness. But again, that's a very intangible concept. Uh, but what I think is important about this definition is that it's in real time. It's the ability to deliver, to speak in real time without a lot of planning. And to do that, of course, you can't afford to have long pauses. You can't afford to be constantly self-correcting and so on. So there's, a, there's the spontaneity factor, factor that is very, very important here. I'm not happy with any of these definitions, I have to say, and I'm going to, I'm going to suggest another one in a minute, but just let's look at some of the uh, more recent research into, um, oh, yeah, we've looked at the speech rate, into fluency, and I'm making a distinction here between productive fluency or measurable fluency, if you like, and then what are we going to call perceptive fluency or the impression that you give of fluency. Um, so some of the factors that have been identified for productive fluency are speech rate. Then that's fair enough. I mean, that's measurable. And that's what 
the person in the street will understand by fluency too. To, to, if you pause a, 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 a lot and if you keep repeat, repeating yourself, you're not going to sound fluent. So you've got to have lots of words coming out uh, in real time spontaneously. And where you do pause, um, well, and not only that, must, yeah, where you do pause, the pauses must not be after every word. It's better to have what are called long runs. A run is a sequence of words without a pause. And so another measure of fluency is how long the runs are. Three words, four words, five words. If it's only one word at a time, you're not going to sound fluent. But if you can speak a lot of words like this, you're going to sound fluent. And, <laughs> and uh, people who are professionally fluent, people whose job r involves fluency, have often found to have extremely long runs. And I'm thinking of people like um, sports commentators, particularly on fast sports like horse racing. Uh, or auctioneers, you know what an auctioneer is, you know, so that kind of thing. But it's very, very repetitive, so they're able to achieve these long runs because they're using basically the same thing again and again and again and again. We'll come back to that. Pauses, uh, that's easy to, to measure, and you can measure the length of them and the number of them, uh, and also uh, those which are filled or not. Um, I'm just checking, would I come back to that? Yeah, so pausing is one thing. Pausing will, not, will make you sound disfluent if you pause while you're planning the next utterance. So what do we do to cover the fact that we're pausing? You use fillers, yeah? You use fillers like, um... But that actually can also have a negative effect because you know, nobody's fooled by the fact that you're just filling the pause with um, or you can, 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 you can repeat yourself. Uh, and what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say, or use fill it like sort of, yes, sort of, it's like, you know, it's like sort of, it's like sort of, Yanni. <laughs> Do you use Yanni in Iranian? Oh. Yanni, that's the most wonderful. It's the first thing I learned. The first word I, wor word I learned in Cairo when I arrived, Yanni. It's a, it's, a, it's a filler. I didn't realize they used it in Iranian, but it's, it's certainly in Arabic. Egyptian Arabic is a filler. It's like, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. And I, I, <laughs> I'd arrived from a flight from London with another teacher. We were about to start work in the language school. The other teacher's name was Jane, and we were taken out to dinner or lunch at the pizzeria in the Hilton and, uh, by the school lawyer, who was Egyptian. And he spoke fluent English, but he used Yanni a lot in his English. And he would go, so welcome, to e welcome in Egypt, Yanni. It's, you know, it's a lovely place, Yanni. And the <laughs> so this woman who I came out with said, excuse me, uh, Dr. Niazi, my name is Jane, not Yanni. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all about filling pauses, right? You've got to fill them. You're allowed to pause, but if you, if you don't fill the pause, what's also going to happen if you're having a conversation? Silence. There'll be silence on your part, so what will happen? Typically, somebody else will fill it. They'll think you've stopped speaking, yeah? So you'll lose your turn, yeah? So it's very, very important from that point of view if you want to maintain the floor, not to pause unduly. Now the use of chunks, this is what I was re referencing with le length. One way of, of lengthening your runs to make your, the sequences longer is to use formulaic language, taking expressions down off the shelf, as it were, as a whole package. So these are expressions, idioms, catchphrases, that sort of thing. That's a good one. That sort of thing. They're often vagueness mark, uh, expressions of vagueness and that sort of thing. So that's a really useful to have a, a repertoire, if you like, a library of those memorized that you can use to give the impression, at least, of fluency. Um, and we'd call them chunks, you know, generally. As a, uh, uh, yes, the fillers I've mentioned, uh, the filling the pauses. OK, so those are some of the things that you can sort of measure those. Uh, and those could be useful for testing purposes, et cetera, if we want to assess somebody's fluency. But there seems to be more to it than simply these uh, measurable factors. And this, uh, this is not 
again, I'm, I'm quoting from the research. This is not an insight of mine, but it's a, it confirms my own intuition about there's more to fluency than simply pausing and speaking fast. It's the perception that you give, the impression that you give uh, that you are fluent. And again, what is it that makes some... And it came up in the discussion when we were comparing the Italian boy and the... There were other factors which were less to do with how fast they were speaking and how many pauses, but the overall impression that they gave. Uh, one is accent. You can't get away from the fact that people are going to, to make some kind of assessment of your overall fluency depending on the strength of your accent. That is to say, how strong it is, your first language accent. If it's very strong, however fast you speak, you will be rated less well than somebody who doesn't have such a strong accent. And that's just a fact of the matter. Uh, now, it relates to what we were talking about last night, yesterday afternoon. You can't ever get rid of your first language acquisition. You might not want to, and you probably don't need to. Nevertheless, some learners may need to be told that their accent is going to, to be the first thing that people will judge them by. It is. Uh, and therefore, uh, they might want to consider that, uh, working on that to modify to, to a certain extent if it's going to give the impression that they're not fluent. Pragmatics, pragmatics are the kind of, all the things that are often non-linguistic, things like politeness, or even things like how close you stand to somebody, those kinds of things. Yes, there's all sorts of uh, contextual factors which give the impression that you're fluent because you look like you know how to behave in the language. Uh, and that uh, relates to, is this coming up? Um, yeah. Uh, the complex, this was mentioned by this lady, the complexity and range, meaning the grammatical complexity, how sophisticated the language. If you only speak using the present simple and you're telling, talking about the past, I mean, you will perhaps be judged less fluent if somebody uses the past. Similarly, if you avoid using conditional constructions but try to express that idea not using a conditional construction, if I hadn't lost my passport, I wouldn't have had such a bad time. You say, I lost my passport, I had a bad time, oh dear. Now that is the same idea without using the conditional, but it doesn't sound quite as complex. So that does have an impression, make an impression, perhaps less on your kind of person in the street than it does on critical language teachers. That's a point. Also, the range by range, vocabulary range. If you throw in a few expressions that are perhaps not so frequent or quite I idiomatic, and that relates to the next thing, idiomaticity, then you can make a strong impression of uh, fluency, even if it's, you're not that fluent. I remember once in Spain, not long after I'd been there, for about, I'd been there to be six months, I was invited to a dinner party, and I was with other speakers of Spanish, and I was talking to this woman, and I used the expression al fin y al cabo, which means at the end of the day, basically. It's a kind of idiomatic expression. I just read it somewhere. It's a very good, but it's a nice chunk. So at the end of the day, all things being equal, blah, 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 al fin y al cabo. Anyway, so we were carried on speaking, and then at, after a, a bit more, I said to her, I'm really sorry about my terrible Spanish. She said, no, your Spanish is excellent. And I said, what do you mean? She said, use, you use the expression al fin y al cabo. So that was like iconic. It was a marker that you were somehow had, you had a foot in the door in terms of idiomaticity. Phrasal verbs are like that. That's why we teach phrasal verbs. We don't really need to teach phrasal verbs. But if you can use phrasal verbs correctly, you sound like, wow. I remember I was at a conference in Liverpool, uh, and there were a number of Chinese um, Students at the University of Liverpool were helping out here, like, I mean, at the, like they are here at the uni, uh, uh, in the conference. And one of them said to me, they were students of English or studying master's programs, and one of them said to me, he saw me in the corridor and said, oh, can, can, um, would you mind signing a copy of your book? I said, well, I never say no to that. So, uh, so I said, of course, of course. And he said, just a minute, I'll, I'll fish it out. Yeah. And he went down to his, I'll fish it. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> 10 out of 10 for fluency. Just that one, you know, it's just, not that I'll get it out or I'll pull it out, but I'll fish it out. So, I mean, that was really, really idiomatic. So that's the kind of thing that, that can make an impression of fluency, even if you're not that fluent. Nonverbal, what do I mean by that? I mean gesture, body language, body language facial expressions. And I think, going back to our two, both of them were very, presented themselves 
quite well uh, in terms of their sort of body language. It was not, they weren't sort of timid. Um, it is interesting, studies that have been done on, uh, speaker, on gesture. Speakers who gesture tend to give the impression of being more fluent than those who don't. Although if you just, <coughs> if you just gesture as a kind of pause filler, <laughs> you're not going to look very fluent. You have to gesture and speak at the same time. And they've done tests of people doing the same task. So somebody doing a speaking task without gesturing and doing exactly the same task, the same words and gesturing at the same time. And generally, the speaker who gestures is rated better than the one, or the version in which the speaker gestures is rated better than the one when he doesn't. So that's something, if you're, if you're preparing students for IELTS interviews or whatever, tell them not to sit on their hands. You know, that'll create a good impression if they gesture. Um, and then, oh, oh, this is the depressing thing. The research says that people judge fluency on accuracy. So it's not just about the complexity. It's about how accurate you are at the little pieces. So this is the, very interesting. We've always tried to keep a separation between fluency and accuracy. Uh, 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 like that. You know, that was very much how the communicative approach wanted to see things. On the one hand, there's accuracy, and on the other hand, fluency, and they don't sort of leak into each other. But it may be more realistic to think of it like this, that accuracy is a subcomponent of fluency. It's not the only thing. And it certainly doesn't guarantee fluency, but you will be judged. Your fluency will be judged partly, partly, at least by some people, on your accuracy. Uh, and so, as somebody said, judgments of fluency actually embrace linguistic accuracy in some way. However, I'm <clears throat> I still like to think that it's that you can compensate for lack of grammatical sophistication or accuracy. Uh, and, and, and by working on these other kinds of areas. There was a very interesting a case study done in the 1980s of a Japanese uh, immigrant into the United States called Wes. You must have read this. It's Richard Schmidt did this study. It's one of the classic case studies in second language acquisition research. Did it, did it in the 1980s. And this immigrant, Wes, had very basic level of English, despite the fact that he was very well integrated into Hawaiian society. He was a professional artist. He had lots of uh, American fr friends. He used English in his work, but his English, in fact, was pretty basic. It was uh, like this. And this is, you know, a transcription I'm, with the pauses. I know I'm speaking funny English because I'm never learning. I'm only just listen, then talk. But people understand. Well, some people confuse before, okay, but. Now it's a little bit difficult because many people are meeting only just one time. Sometimes so difficult. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great little chunk. But you can see that, I mean, he's certainly nowhere near the level of sophistication of our two speakers we started with, just on the basis of the transcript. But what was interesting uh, is that he, um, after being studied over a period of three years, his grammar didn't improve. Uh, noticeably at all. I mean, he remained, he basically had fossilized. But his communicative ability seemed to have improved enormously. He was able to interact fluently with all the people he had to deal with, such that when people were asked by the researcher, how would you rate Wes's English, they always gave him 10 out of 10 kind of thing. Oh, no, it's fantastic. Very good. Very, really, really fluent he is. Fantastic. Except there was only one group of people who rated him negatively. Who were they? English teachers. English teachers, judgmental. very judgmental, right. obsessed with accuracy. Uh, so Schmidt, the researcher, concluded, he says, why do people think his English is so good when he doesn't use prepositions, articles, plurals, and tense? And he, Schmidt concluded, I think it's because when people talk to him and listen to him, they don't notice that he doesn't use them. Yeah. And the one reason that he does, they don't uh, notice is that what, one of his strategies as a speaker was to communicate at all costs. It was what's called willing, willingness to communicate now in the literature. He had this, and somebody mentioned this, I think, with regard to the Italian boy. He had this kind of like willingness. desire, this willingness to communicate at all costs. And also, what was interesting, he also expected his 
interlocutors, the people who are speaking with, to make some effort to understand him. So, you know, he recognized that it's, it takes two to tango when you're talking about communication. And then, uh, but if you put a lot of effort into communicating, then it will be reciprocated in terms of people making an effort to understand you. So I think that's very interesting. Again, so what Wes was able to do was convey the perception of fluency. But actually, when you broke it down, he wasn't either accurate, I imagine he had a fairly strong accent, etc. Um, so a concluding comment from the literature. A fluent performance, it is fluent performance that is probably the overriding determiner. Other features as accuracy are of lesser importance and thus easily become subsumed. So, I mean, accuracy is there, but accent and all these other things become subsumed under the overall fluent performance, the desire to communicate, the coherence, etc. So, which has led me to redefine fluency as, this is my best attempt so far, my attempt to define it. Fluency is the to convey the impression of idiomatic, so the idiomaticity has to be there, intelligibility, so it's all about not just accent, but also the overall coherence, in real time. So that tries to bring together the spontaneity factor that you're planning and speaking at the same time, that it's, an, it's perceptive just as much as productive, that it's idiomatic, that it has to be intelligible at every level. Does that like, you know, do you like that? Yeah. Do you like that? You're going to have it. It's yours. <laughs> Took me forever. <laughs> Um, uh, the new edition, I think, of the A to Z of ELT. So it's a it's brand new idea. So let's look at... Wow. Um, yeah, I better move on. Okay, let's look, at, uh, let's look at the teaching then. Okay, so traditionally, traditionally, the movement has been... You focus at the beginner's level, almost 100% on accuracy, and then gradually as students move up the scale, you allow them more fluency. And I mean, again, referencing my class last night, uh, yesterday I was talking about my Egyptians who really were keen to move here more rapidly and were able to do that to a certain extent once I, I gave them a little bit of uh, slack. What would it be like if we did it the other way around? If we started with fluency, worked on fluency, and then gradually fine-tuned for accuracy. That, after all, is how we learn our first language. We don't start accurate. We start saying things like, daddy, work, mummy, cook. Um, and we, but we get our meanings across, and then these become fine-tuned. For some reason, the teaching of second languages reverses the natural order. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, but let, let's look at sort of the more practical aspects of fluency and, and remind ourselves that fluency is a, and language generally, is a skill. It's a skill like any other skill, a sporting skill or musical skill or whatever. It is acquired by practice, exactly. And you become skillful the more you practice. Not only practice, you also need feedback. Um, but if we remember, remind ourselves that it's a skill, it's useful that because we can look at the literature and the research into other, the learning of other skills and maybe pick up some tips about the learning of languages. So people who study this kind of thing, how s skilled practitioners or expert practitioners become skillful, have identified a number of things that um, skilled performers can do. One of them is that they can work fast. So it is about speed. Mm -hmm you know, in language, as in skiing. Uh, and they can be spontaneous and they can cope with unpredictability. A skilled driver can, can cope with a dog running across in front of the car. They can anticipate and plan ahead while they're actually performing. 
And that's really important, of course, in speaking. They can ignore the inessentials, yeah? Like, oh, the little things don't so much count. They can carry on the task using minimal means. And that's, in a sense, what Wes, the Japanese and Hawaii, was able to do. He was able to use minimal means, but he was, and he ignored the prepositions and the articles and things, but he was able to come across as fluent. And, there it is, the, ma the, the A word again, they can be accurate. So if you're a skilled guitarist, it's not enough to be fast. You've got to be able to play the right notes. <laughs> if you're a skilled driver, it's not enough just to be, drive fast. You've got to drive on the right side of the road, or the left side of the road. Um, so <laughs> accuracy, you know, we can't escape it. Uh, and to be versatile. And that's, again, I think is uh, important with speaking. You've got to be able to do... Uh, You've got to be able to do conversation, but you've also got to be able to do more formal stuff if you're going to be a completely fluent speaker. It's not enough to be fluent just with friends. You need to be fluent in other contexts. And you also need to be reliable. You need to be able to do the task equally well under difficult conditions. And this is very important in the classroom. Students may be fine doing pair work and group work, but get them up performing in front of the class and they go to pieces. Or put them in an exam situation and they go to pieces. They're not reliable. So we need to remind ourselves that whatever we do in the class, we need to sometimes perhaps crank up the degree of stress related to the task. Because after all, a lot of real language use is used in conditions which are quite stressful. But learners need to be able to cope with that. If they only ever use English sitting down, will they be able to cope using English standing up? So get them on their feet, get them out in front of the class, film them, record them. Because that adds an extra element of stress, but it's good stress, it's nice stress. Can I tell you a story? No. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so, I will in a minute, I'll come back, uh, related to my Spanish classes. So, in a, a wonderful article that was written way back in 1988, uh, two Canadian researchers decided a, a short list of what activities to develop fluency should contain on the basis of what, looking at skill theory generally, what is it that in language learning and second language learning makes a good fluency activity? And these are, this is a great list and it's really been uh, very important to me. Genuinely communicative. Now, genuinely communicative. In the sense that, just as yesterday, remember the activity when you were talking about with your photos on your things? You didn't know who that person was, so you were asking questions because you didn't know and you wanted to find out. So that was genuinely communicative. Now one reason, one reason why this is good is that because it, it, it distracts the attention from trying to always be accurate. If you have something you really want to communicate, you're not going to really worry about being using the right prepositions. Or, you know, if you're if you're if you're if you're if you're in a hotel and you see smoke coming out of the thing and you phone down to reception, I don't really care how accurate my Armenian is to tell the receptionist that the hotel is on fire. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to waste time. Uh, I'm going to be communicative, and that's going to put the focus on the right thing. Psychologically authentic means that. Again, it's like the standing up rather than sitting down. It should try to replicate the conditions in which language is used in the real world. And so often, isn't it the case that you learn something in the classroom and a little dialogue for shopping, for example, and then you go to a shop and you try it out and everything goes wrong. You can't remember. They say something you weren't expecting. You're nervous, etc. And so what we need to do is replicate in the classroom situations where students are speaking, where there's a bit of pressure on them, a bit of urgency. And I'll, I'll talk about activities later. It also needs to be focused. It means if you're trying to do too many things at once, you'll, it, you'll drop something. Yeah? So by, I'll show you in a second what I mean by focused. Well, one way it can be focused is formulaic. Remember we said formulaic language, chunks, is really good. So if we can build chunks into our 
uh, practice activities, then a, hopefully the students will internalize those chunks and be able to use them to make them like expressions like, you know what I mean, you know what I mean, you know what I mean. They'll, they'll be able to achieve perceptive fluency. And finally, inherently repetitive. We were saying yesterday, oh, drills, 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 no good. But no, actually, we need an element of repetition because that's what practice is, essentially. So we want activities that have all these features. And what kinds of activities would they be? Well, here is one. OK, well, just skip that list. Ooh. Here is one, a classic one that you all know and love, the find someone who. You know find someone who? It's a classic. So students are given prompts, a list. They've got to find someone who. Uh, has been to China, ha, ha, ha. Uh, but they'll have a list of places or a list of things. So this is for the present perfect, obviously. So what are they going to do? They're going to get up, they're going to move around the class, or if they can't get up, they're going to talk, move around, talk to people adjacent to them, and they're going to ask the question, have you ever been to China? And they're going to have to listen to the answer because they know at the end of the activity, the teacher's going to say, so how many people did you find have been to China? So they're going to have to process this information. That's communicative. They're going to have to get up and ask the question, and it's the same question. Have you ever been to China? Have you? Or it's variations of that question. Have you ever been to China? Have you ever driven a Mercedes? Have you ever lived in overseas or whatever? whatever. But it's going to be formulaic. Have you ever? Have you ever? Have you ever? Have you ever? And focused, focused on one particular function, asking about experience. And inherently repetitive, because if you've got 16 students in the class, and they're all up, up on their feet, there's going to be six, you're going to be asking that question 16 times, and you're going to be asked a similar question 16 times. So there's masses amounts of huge volume of repetition. So this, this is an activity. It's a classic, but it's a good one because it fulfills all those conditions of a good fluency activity. So the chances are that the students, each time they repeat the question, they're going to get a little bit better at it. And also, it's the, there's going to be a better chance that they'll actually remember it. It'll be, go, move into long-term memory, not just short-term memory. So let's just go back. These are some of the activities that I think fulfill the guessing games. Guessing games are fantastic. I'm going to think of a job. It's so my imaginary, no, this is my real job. You have to ask me and guess it. So you're going to ask me questions like yes, no questions. Do you work outdoors? Do you work indoors? Do you work, wear a uniform? Do you use your hands, etc. So the, it's very formulaic. There's going to be a lot of questions with do you or can you or do you have to. But you don't know the answer, so you have to listen and process. And all with children, I'm an animal. Yeah? So how many legs have you got? Can you fly? Do you lay eggs, etc. That kind of thing. Coffee potting, exactly. That, so any kind of guessing game where it's inherently repetitive and students have to listen to each other, it's communicative and it's focused. So that's a, a great thing. So, uh, uh, so here's one just using this picture. You know these where, where's Wally, is it, pictures? <laughs> so I'm, let's home in a bit. I'm one person in the picture. You have to ask me questions like, are you the person who? Yeah? So, okay, so you see what I mean? And so the students can do that in pairs. Are you the person who is sitting on the boat? Are you the person playing the ball with the ball? Are you the person who, etc., etc., etc.? Or if that's too complicated, are you sitting on the boat? Are you playing with the ball? But that's a kind of guessing game. I'm choosing the person. You. Okay. Uh, surveys. Surveys like find someone who. That's a kind of a survey. We're surveying, and you can do that about any subject. So let's say the subject is food. Uh, we can design some questions about food to find out a general profile of the class, whether that we are foodies or not. Yeah? So do you only eat Armenian food? Do you eat Iranian food? Do you sometimes eat Chinese food, etc.? Those are good questions. Do you cook yourself? Do you cook at home? Do you have any recipe books, etc., that kind of thing. So you can get surveys. Now, the students are going around asking each other these questions, a bit like a find someone who, and, they're getting, and then they can collate the information and present the information to the rest of the class. They need to know that they're going to do that because that forces them to listen. Um, this is a great one. Let's just flash ahead. Uh, yeah. So one of us can, two of us can, all of us can, none of us can. This is a fantastic... 
it's a machine for generating sort of uh, sentences, but also for developing fluency. So students in groups of four or three, in this case, have to generate as many sentences, true sentences, using this model. Yeah? So one group of three, one group of three, one group of three, one group of three. So how are they going to do that? They're going to have to ask some questions. Can you, can you, can you play the guitar? Can you stand on your head? Can you speak Chinese and that kind of thing, until they get enough questions so that they can then report to the rest of the class. One of us, none of us, all of us can. And of course you can change, it doesn't have to be can, it could be has been, or would, or is going to, or has to. Yeah? So it's a wonderful machine for generating sentences for any grammatical structure. It's not fluent in the sense that they're doing it fast, but when they report, to the rest of the class, then that can be, it can open up and be a bit more fluent. Um, this is an activity, again, it's a, it's a classic, it's, it goes way back to the 1960s. As students told that they're going to go on a holiday, a vacation, they have to choose a month, uh, they have to choose a resort, and they have to choose a hotel. So each student secretly chooses, say, for example, I'm going to go to Venice in July and I'm going to stay at the Ritz. Okay, that's in my head. Now, the students get up, they have to go walk around the class to find somebody who's got the same combination so that they can go together. So they say, I, and it's yes, no questions. Are you going to, uh, or it could be WH questions, where are you going, or are you going to Venice, when are you going, where are you going to stay? So you see the repetitive thing, and the chances are they won't find somebody straight away, especially if you can make this list longer. Uh, so the combinations, but they're going to have to go around asking lots of times these same questions. It's focus, it's formulaic, are you going to, are you going to, are you going to, are you going to. Or you can do a variety of this. I have a version which with, with, the, with can for ability. You have street performers. Street performers, somebody who can dance, can sing and play an instrument. So you have to choose an instrument, you have to choose a type of song, like opera or uh, rap or whatever, and a kind of dance, like tango or... Um, or salsa or whatever. And so I'm a trombone player, I sing opera and I, and I dance the flamenco, okay? So I'm going to go around saying, can you dance flamenco? Can you dance flamenco? Looking for my ideal partner. So that's okay. It's a little bit artificial, but it's, it has all those features of those other activities. Let's just go back to my list. Uh, carousel. So you know what a carousel is, like in a fairground, and it goes round and round. A carousel activity is one where you have uh, one group of students in a circle, stationary, and the other group, the rest of the class, moving from one to another. So imagine, with kids, uh, they've got their family tree, they've drawn their family tree, and they've put pictures, cut up pictures, of their mother, father, brothers and sisters on their family tree. And that was their homework, and they come to the class. They put, there's 24 children in the class, they, 12 of them stand with their pictures around the room. The other 12 go up and look at the picture and say, who's that? Tell me about your family, blah, blah, blah. They describe their family using their family tree and then at a signal, they move to the next one and they ask that family. And, that, and then when all that 12 have gone around, then they go and stand with their pictures to the wall and the other ones, you get the idea? So what happens is that this, Children are having the same conversation 12 times about, about different families, but basically the language is very similar and very controlled. And each time they have that conversation, they're going to get more fluent and more accurate. Why? Because task repetition has been shown to really, 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 really help fluency. Task, doing the same task again. And so often in class, we get students to do something, it's really nice, and they have a nice little conversation, and then that's it. Yeah. And we say, no, no, we should do it again, because look at this, look at the evidence. Here's a, um, this is a researcher was looking at how students doing a task, this, this is just describing a picture story. The first time they did it, and they did it a second time, and then they did it the third time, and the third time you can see appreciable increase in length and in accuracy. 
So they went to the park by car, and he'd go with his dog, and he'd take lunchbox, and I have sandwich and hamburger, champagne, champagne sandwich, and very peaceful, but later many people will come. And, say, and look at this. It was a nice sunny day, so Tom and Victoria decided to go to picnic in the countryside. Look at the difference. It's night and day, and it's because they did it again, and it again, and again. Now, teachers, I think, are a little bit nervous about getting students to repeat things, because students get boring. You just change the combination, that's all. You do it with another student, that's all. It's as easy as that. But even then, I don't think it's necessary the fact that students are going to get boring. So here's my story, um, and it relates to the conversation we had last yesterday about my Spanish classes. Remember, I, when I was studying Spanish in my intensive classes, one of the themes was cities, cities of the world. And the teacher had this inspiration that each of us would give a presentation to the class about a city of our choice. Yeah? It wasn't in the book, it was just her idea. And so we went away and we prepared and we gave our presentations. Now, this was a fantastic experience because what it forced me, to, I chose a city where I was born. Where was I born? Uh, <laughs> and the city is called Rotorua, and it's famous because um, of its geothermal activity. There's a lot of bubbling mud and, and steam geysers coming out of the ground, etc. And uh, it's a very big tourist attraction. It's worth going to. But a lot of people don't know this, and so it was very interesting doing my presentation, but I had to look up all these words in Spanish, like bubbling mud. Uh, and, and steam geysers and things like that. And that, so I spent a lot of time the night before preparing. And then I went onto Google Image and got lots of pictures and made a lovely PowerPoint. And then I presented it to the students in my class. And they were really interested and they asked questions. And the teacher took notes and then she gave me some feedback. And I felt so good. I was doing something at the edge, at the limits of my competence. I was pushed to the very edge of my competence. I was standing on my feet. I was speaking Spanish. I was speaking for a long, like those two kids we saw at the beginning, monologue. It was very, 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 very challenging. But I was able to meet the challenge just. But it wasn't, I wasn't satisfied 100%. And the teacher's feedback was quite lengthy, needless to say. There was a lot of accuracy errors, etc. But nevertheless, the experience was fantastic. Except, what didn't she do? What didn't she let me do? <laughs> to do it again. Please, dear teacher, let me do it again. Do it better. I know I can do it better. But her aunt was like, oh, no, we haven't got time. And the other students will get bored. No, they won't, because you say to the other students, now, Scott's going to do it again. You've heard the feedback. You've got to tick the number of times the things that he does better from the feedback. You see what I mean? There could be a checklist. So, uh, and the first time he didn't use the, he got the gender wrong of the word whatever. Let's see if he can get it right this time. So that gives the students a task to listen to the repeat. I would have loved the opportunity to do that again. So that's all about task repetition. And do you notice, how would you rate my fluency? How would you rate my fluency in English? <laughs> Do you think I've done this talk before? Do you think this is the first time I've done this talk? You're okay. <laughs> no, it's not. I've done this talk a number of times, and each time I do it, I get better at it. So there's another lesson. Repeat, repeat, repeat. It's practice, 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 practice. That's all. That's it. Lovely. Thank you. Let's have a break. <laughs>